最前沿的科学研究。There are currently more than fourteen thousand individuals in the U.S. at any given time that are hoping for a liver transplant, and every ten minutes, one more person is added to that list. Hi, my name is Shenning, and this is Mehdi Jorfi, and we are the co-hosts of Science Rehashed. Welcome to this episode. So this episode is about liver transplantation. Mehdi, can you tell us a little bit more about the current status and the challenges in liver transplantation? Yeah, as you said, every year there are not enough donor livers available for the people who need liver transplants. But this mismatch is not only caused by shortage of organ donors; can also sometimes be how to deliver a donated liver to the person who needs it. Depending on where a donor and recipient live, this may not be enough time to transport the organ and prepare for surgery. So. Long story short, the real enemy is time. For example, according to the Organ Preservation Alliance, one fifth of donated kidneys are never transplanted, and almost two thirds of donated hearts and lungs are wasted. That's a lot of wasted organs and a lot of lives that could have been saved. And there are two main problems for that: either we run out of time to do the transplantation, or Because of the damaged organ. So, Shen, could you tell us a little bit about the paper that changed the whole game in liver transplantation? Yes, it's very exciting. So, in this paper, we are talking about the new technology, super cooling, which is super cool. Currently, super cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, the current clinical standard for preserving a human organ right now is about 12 hours, and using this new technology, they call subnormothermic machine perfusion. They can extend that time to 24 hours, which is huge. That means an organ on the East Coast in Boston, for example, can be transplanted、uh, potentially to a patient on the West Coast in California. In 2014, they've shown this technology in rat livers. Can you tell us more about that, Medi? So, as you said, in 2014, the same group reported an outstanding paper, which they were able to preserve rat livers. For several days without losing the viability of the organ. However, when they translated the same technique to the human livers, they encountered several challenges. Today, we are honored and privileged to have Dr. Kirkett Oigon, an associate professor in the surgery department at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, with his research fellow, Dr. Renier Devries, to talk about all the challenges. With liver transplantation, the whole field, and where we are going for, with this super cooling technology in the future. So, thank you for joining us today. We would like to first start off about you guys, how you started working on liver preservation. So, Dr. Devries, why don't you start? I joined this lab as an intern when I was still a medical student in、uh, in Amsterdam.、Mm -hmm. So,、um, I I came overseas here to、um, to the Center for Engineering Medicine、um, for my、um, Research part of my study in medicine,、um, and during my medicine study, I also did an engineering、uh, study in me、uh, study in mechanical engineering, and I was really looking for a place where I could,、uh, you know, combine those two backgrounds、um, in one research project. And that's actually when I started working、uh, here in、uh, Dr. Wigan's lab,、um, and his lab is、um, focused on on liver preservation. So that's kind of how I rolled into the、um, into the subject. But I really was. Intrigued by you know how can we use new technologies to、uh, help with a real medical problem?、Uh, and Dr. Oigan, I came to see back in 2006 as a postdoctoral fellow. Before that, I was doing some metabolic modeling on the liver, and it was clear to me that I had no idea what I was trying to model. So I came here to actually learn and see livers. And at the time, there was a the liver perfusion project was just starting. We had used it as a model in different contexts, but for Recovery and perfusion for with the intent for transplantation was、uh, relatively new. So, where were you before you were at the Center for Engineering in Medicine or SEM? I did my PhD at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, downtown Detroit.、Uh, with my wife, actually, we did our PhDs together. We are very excited about the paper, the technology, and in general, the whole innovation. 
Before we dive into the paper and the experiments, I would like you to comment on the field of organ preservation and for example, why we need to keep the liver outside of the body. During transplantation, there is an inevitable time when the, when the liver or any other organ um, has to survive a certain period outside of the human body. And during this time, there is some injury to the organ. And currently, that's the reason. Because of that injury, that's the reason why we can only use the highest quality of grafts. And also, we have to use those grafts. And graft, I mean the, the donor organ. And we have to use those grafts also within a very short time because the longer the time we keep it outside the body, the more injury there is. And eventually there is a point where there's too much injury and the organ will fail after transplantation. This has two consequences. First of all, we can only use a very small subset of the actual organs that are donated. The second thing is that we have to use them within a very short time frame. The time limits the distance that we can match the donor and the recipient. And for transplantation, you have to match the immune systems of the donor and the recipient. And the better the match, the less rejection after transplantation there is. It's a threefold problem. One is the insufficient number of donors. The second is quality of the livers. But probably I think the real enemy is time. So also because the, 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 the time that we can preserve those organs, that additionally because of all the logistical hurdles, that also causes some proportion of organs also to be discarded because just literally time runs out and that organ cannot be transplanted. The clinical maximum that we use here at MGH is nine hours. And depending on the quality of the organs and which center you're talking about, some um, currently some centers go up to 12 hours. So for now, it really depends on where the donor and the recipient lives. For example, can you transplant a liver that has been donated from a person on the West Coast to a patient on the East Coast? Impossible. If the donor was in Chicago, we couldn't do this in Boston. Just there is not enough time. So let's dive into the technique and the paper that very recently published in Nature Biotechnology. Before we go into the very recent paper, I would like to just sum up, or if one of you can sum up the previous paper that published, I think in 2014, that you developed a procedure called supercooling that could successfully preserve rat liver for several days. And then I think you moved on to translate the same technique with the human liver. Correct, the 2014 work and Tim Burns and deserves all the credit for sticking with, uh, with the process and, and the project and making it work along with both the Burns now I should say. You summed it nicely. This was the original uh, attempt of supercooling organs which had never been done or possibly not conceived before. It was a lot of experimentation. We had to figure out just about everything from how to actually properly do perfusion to what kind of additives was necessary and sort of iterate on them. And what is supercooling? Why do you call it supercooling? It is a thermodynamical term. I'm a chemical engineer by training. Water does not freeze immediately at zero degrees, as I like to say to your high school teacher lied to you. So it's a stochastic process. Nucleation can start if there is some kind of site that helps catalyze that event, essentially. Let's dig in like a little bit deeper. What is nucleation? Nucleation is the process of forming uh, the seed ice. That's what we call the ice nucleus. That seed records that the water molecules are aligned in a particular configuration, a particular way that sort of are close to each other. You have the hydrogen and oxygen close to each other and everything. You are basically forming a crystal. So that process happens on its own too, even if you have pure water, but that actually becomes thermodynamically certain at, I think, minus 40 degrees Celsius or so. Until then, between this 0 to, 40, zero to minus 40 degrees range, you know, it's, it's a matter of chance if the nucleation event, this ice seeding event is going to happen. Until minus 20 degrees, it's actually what's called homogeneous, water molecules just finding each other to find this crystal. Is not a dominant effect at all. Until then, the reason we have ice uh, around zero degrees when you go around in winter, is the ice nucleation has been catalyzed by something. That something can be an impurity, just a piece of dust or whatever that's in the water. It can be the air-water interface that forces the water molecules to align. That initiates the nucleation. So supercooling means that you can basically take the the liquid organ, whatever you want, below that zero degrees Celsius with some confidence that it will stay unfrozen for a little longer. 
there's obviously a limit in terms of especially in temperature. So the supercooling technique that has been used in the 2014 paper did not work in the human liver. Is it because the human liver is 200 times bigger than the rat liver? Yes, that's, that's correct. The larger your volume becomes, the chance that there is one of those impurities that becomes exponentially larger because it's not that you need a million of those impurities to cause like several sides of ice nucleation, but you just need one side of ice nucleation. And from there, once that ice started, the whole volume starts to grow and eventually your complete volume freezes. So the fact that those human livers, that they are much bigger than the red livers, it means that it's that just pure physically makes it exponentially harder to keep them free from ice with supercooling. And then in addition, there is the fact that we need to precondition the organs prior to supercooling. And because of the larger size of the organ, it's harder to achieve that in a homogeneous way. And I, I say homogeneous because it's, it's very important to do it homogeneous because if you have one side in the liver, let's say that, you know, the left side of the liver is not well preconditioned, you can perfectly precondition the right side, but there's still a chance that if, if the nucleation starts in like a less well preconditioned side, that it kind of crosses over to the well conditioned side and just starts freezing there. Right now in the paper, it's, you say that you try to super cool the organ to minus four degrees, correct? So why is it that you're trying to achieve four degrees, not two degrees or 10 minus 10 degrees? The lower you can go, the more benefits you will get. So, so you do want to try to even go yes. lower. Um, okay. Metabolic suppression. So this is one of rule that every 10 degrees you drop in temperature, your metabolism is roughly half. And if your metabolic uh, metabolism is half to that, you are basically using your supplies to survive during this preservation time twice as much. So okay. the lower the better. So as a scientist speaking, I believe this is very difficult. You already start with a suboptimal organ and you need to develop and validate the technique, the machine for perfusions and everything based on a not perfectly valuable organ. And you need to assess all the valuable factors based on the first state, which is already is not perfect or maintain the conditions. Yes, that's what I think why it's an exciting paper in terms of translational research. And and the way how we how we achieve this is by having by doing a viability measurement during machine perfusion um, before we did our preservation protocol, supercooling preservation protocol, and after it. And I think in that sense, it's of course not our only research. There is a lot of research out there about machine perfusion, and we were definitely able to, you know, use the information that we had and some optimizations from other papers as well to kind of almost take that perfusion as a platform and use it in this strategy. So we fortunately, and I think we couldn't even have done it is to like also on the side develop the whole machine perfusion platform. And when you test the parameters before and after the perfusion, what do you look for? So there is typically there are two different types of parameters, roughly. Um, I would say you can look for injury parameters and function parameters. So certain injury parameters um, you can see, for example, on histology. So that's like tissue biopsies and you, under the microscope, you can see injury to the tissue itself. There are certain molecules which are only in high concentration present, present certain enzymes in liver cells. So if they are released in the artificial bloodstream of the perfusion machine, we know that they come from lysed cells. So that's in the parameter of injury. Are those AST and ALT? Yes, AS, AST and ALT. What's the difference between the two? What does each indicate? One of the major functions of the of the liver in the human body is to change certain amino acids into other ones. And to do this, there are certain enzymes called transferases, and there's aspartate aminotransferase and alanine aminotransferase. So those two enzymes and a couple more enzymes, especially for almost for any uh, amino acids, they are present in hepatocytes, so the liver cells. And if if those cells lysed and those enzymes that are inside the liver cells, they are released from the cells into the perfusate or into the blood in the patient. So that means initially when you preserve and perfuse the organs, you should see a initial kind of rise in ASC and LT mm -hmm. just due to the fact that organs are in a different environment and they're, you're, they're slicing because they're touching different things. And after preservation, you expect them to be, you know, 
about the same, correct? Or you want to keep it about the same? There are two things that, that you want to see during perfusion. So first is that if, if there is a high rise at the very start of perfusion, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, that the injury during the perfusion um, that the injury comes from during the perfusion that can also be because the cell lies during uh, the procurement and, and during the transportation to our hospital. And then during the perfusion, you want to see that they're pretty much stable. So pre preferably a flat line. And then after, the pres after our new preservation, uh, we want to see that the rise is about the same as before. And because if, if we would all of a sudden have like a huge spike at the start, it means that there was actually a lot of injury during that initial preservation process, uh, during the supercooling preservation, before the secondary perfusion assessment after the supercooling. Um, but also we want to see that after um, the, that during the perfusion after supercooling that it still stays stable because what's possible is that if cells are slowly dying that those enzymes are released and that you see that the, that the concentration of that into the perfusate of the machine perfusion system is um, slowly increasing. So you talked a lot about the perfusion machine. I want to a little bit dive into the perfusion machine. I believe there are should be a lot of perfusion machines already exist in the market and that they, they, that they can keep the, the, the organ in the normal body temperature. Mm -hmm. What are the limitations of the current perfusion machines and how long they can uh, claim to extend the life of uh, liver outside the body? All of the current technology focuses on normal thermic machine perfusion, meaning at body temperatures meaning at 37 degrees Celsius. This sort of makes intuitive sense because you're trying to mimic what the body does to the organ. If it was fine in the body, if you can mimic the same environment, it should be as well. This is actually what we started with back, what, 10, 15 years ago now, normal thermic perfusion. The problem is, at least in my opinion, you are requesting a lot of or rather full function from the organ at that temperature. So in our experience, if you actually reduce the temperature a little bit, the demands on the organ are actually reduced, uh, meaning it doesn't have to just strive as hard and therefore it can actually have more opportunities to recover itself. Again, this is in our opinion based on our uh, data. It's not a new technology. It's just that we are more sophisticated on how to do this, right? So it's making a comeback, which is great news for us because we can use it as the platform to build the next generation technologies on which again sort of could be the back to the future uh, number two, back to cold storage, except in this case it could be super cooled. Right now, in my view, there are twofold roadblocks. One is we want to preserve the liver to have enough time to donate it to the specific patient. The second question is, is this truly going to function after a transplantation? I'd like to start with the fact that before we can try this in humans, we need a large animal study, so swine or primate, and confirm the results that we now had on the human livers ex vivo, also in like a large animal study, and where we also have to study them, for example, three to six months to see if what that we did to those organs don't have any long-term um, consequences. So that's, I think, very important. And what we did at the end of our protocol to assess, additionally assess the, the viability and the transplantability of the organs is that we changed the solution in the machine to whole blood, that we all of a sudden increase the temperature to body, to body temperature. So it's almost like a stress test. And, and then we compared the results that we got from those already marginal livers to uh, marginal livers that other people tested in other labs where they just got them directly from the donor. So there was not the 27 hour of uh, supercooled preservation. And there we saw that those parameters were in the, in the same ballpark. And do we have any idea with your technology and if it is applied in a clinical setting, how many more recipients will receive a liver compared to before, like percentage wise? Maybe numbers. Honestly, our goal is to abolish the waiting list. Um, mm -hmm. How long it takes to go there is another whole question and somewhat philosophical debate. Uh, but I think just the organs that we currently can use and are considered marginal, we could do that at least with the current gap between supply and demand. Mm -hmm. the, the demand always increases. Once you have enough organs, it will go up too. So that will be the next challenge. And the other thing is I want, uh, this is more personal opinion, but I 
want the uh, the organs to be transplanted and um, shared optimally across the world. Call me a globalist if you want, um, but I want to cure the world. And is it cost effective? The current tools that you've demonstrated in your paper, when we apply it, is it going to be you know twice as expensive as previously, or is it? about the same? That totally depends on how you look at that question. So right now, it's, it would not be cost effective because this is you know, done in very you know, low volumes and nothing has been optimized yet in, in sense scientifically optimized, but not commercially optimized. For example, we needed a perfusion system to precondition the livers um, before the storage, but you can envision, for example, a product where our special design storage solutions are in a bag and that the bag contains a pump, um, which is disposable, which can be quite cheap maybe, and uh, that, that can be brought to the to the donor's hospital instead of the whole machine. But those, I think, technology um, different uh, uh, innovations um, can make it definitely uh, cost effective because basically this technique has the potential to become a similar technique as the current technique where you procure the liver, you flush it with your uh, solution, which has to be done in a more concise manner with supercooling, um, but the basis is the same. And then you store it not on ice, but you can, for example, store it on the medium that melts at a lower temperature um, and then transport it to the hospital where you then will, um, will you, where you will um, transplant the, the liver. So or other organs. So I think it has the potential to, to be a very cost effective uh, method, but currently um, it is it is not. <laughs> is there anything that we have not asked you about your paper or about the field in general that you would like to add? So I'll I'll comment on the um, on the fact that this the field itself seems to have hit a nucleation point. There are multiple papers, multiple new technologies coming online all at the same time. Um, the perfusion is critical because they are now in ROR's in clinical trials, and that's a key technology platform for not just for our work, not just for our technology and paper, but for others too. It's very exciting to be in this field at this particular time. We are just fortunate to do so. And how far you think uh, that this technique is going to be in the clinic? in the near future. Per perfusion is already in the clinics. Um, assessment is um, in some of its earlier phases. The support clinic itself require device development and um, the FDA approvals and all that sort of thing. So that usually takes five to 10 years. Don't hold me to that. There's a lot of other things that have to go into this, including large amount of usually um, in outside investment, not just NIH monies, but actual investment. And we are working on all of those. Hopefully we'll, we'll get there. And then in terms of working together, the, the mechanical and the engineering background and the medical background really comes together in this particular project. The MD, PhD is the most powerful combo education that I have seen. Um, you get the both of bo best of both worlds. I'm a PhD. I don't, I'm not a clinician. I don't understand that, that aspect. Um, if you're an MD, but you don't have scientific training or especially engineering training, you are not necessarily able to develop these technologies. Some people have that gift naturally, but it's not. Uh, it 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 requires that special person. If you have an MD PhD, then uh, he or she is basically trained on both of those. Brainier is a very good example. This is on one hand a very clinical research with human livers and artificial bloods, um, and on the other hand, it's very applied thermodynamics. You have to think like an engineer to make these very complicated systems work. Also, he he brings the best of both worlds. We are lucky to have him. Okay, and beyond the research, I would like to go into your personal life. I know, Kirkett, like you have a beautiful family and a daughter. What are your hobbies? Where you do your best thinking? My favorite hobby is doing math with my, with my daughter. I cannot say the same for her. She hates her math <laughs> homeworks. Uh, but for me, it's great fun. And actually, it's like I remember uh, my old self too. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Um, so I, I am very lucky that I've been married a year ago and uh, that my wife now lives here with me here in Boston uh, and, I, and that made uh, life much better. Um, in addition to having this amazing paper, I think that's kind of like almost nothing to the fact that she now lives here with me. So it sounds like with your technology really bringing it to the clinic is very much in the near future and it will change, you know, the current protocols and improve 
the amount of time that patients get and recipients can get from a potential uh, donor. And that's really critical in this particular field and I think will save you know, many more lives and really reduce that gap that you were mentioning regarding the list, the donor list, correct? So that's it's really exciting. Thank you very much. And it was a very exciting discussion and such a big problem in the organ preservation. And uh, I believe, I think, uh, based on my readings, uh, there, there were 14,000 people right now in the U.S. waiting for the liver. It's a very critical problem, I believe. I really congratulate you on this exciting technology that has been published, and we wish you good luck. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Science Lay Hash. We would also like to thank Dr. Rudy Tenzi for providing us with the music for our intro. Thank you, Rudy. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or you can visit our website at sciencelyhash.com. Our show is available through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Please subscribe and refer our podcast to your friends. We would love to hear your comments and feedback for our show, so don't hesitate to reach out to us via our website.